Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Master Participatory Grant Making by Engaging the Right Voices. My name is Yvonne Sims, Network Engagement Manager for Candid, based in Atlanta, and I'm joined by Ebony Carroll, Network Engagement Assistant, also based in Atlanta. We'll be supporting today's webinar behind the scenes, as well as collecting questions you ask along the way and posing them during the Q&A. For those of you joining us for the first time, we want to share with you that we've joined forces with GuideStar to form a new single organization called Candid. Together, we have over 88 years of experience in the nonprofit sector. Every year, millions of nonprofits spend trillions of dollars around the world. Candid finds out where that money comes from, where it goes, and why it matters. We believe that an effective social sector is critical for a thriving society and we believe in the importance of solutions for the sector, by the sector. With Candid, nonprofits, foundations, donors, and the public can all be on the same page. Through research, collaboration, and training, Candid connects people who want to change the world with the resources they need to do it. I would now like to turn the controls over to our speakers for today, who we're really excited to have join us. We have journalist Meg Massey and Director of Communications at Village Capital, Ben Robel, and they'll tell you a little bit more about themselves. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on this webinar today. Uh, as, um, as Yvonne said, um, well, I guess I should start by thanking the folks at Candid for having us here. We're really excited to talk about our book, Letting Go, How Philanthropists and Impact Investors Can Do More Good by Giving Up Control. Um, for a little bit about me, I'm a journalist. Uh, I've been uh, writing about impact investing for many years now, and I've also worked in a number of communications roles in that space, um, including doing my own consulting over the last few years. And um, this, um, what brought me to this book was um, a desire to democratize the conversation about impact investing. Um, and Ben can, when, I'll let Ben introduce himself and talk a little bit more about how this idea originated. Sure. And if you hear growling or barking, my dog just heard a vacuum outside the door. They weren't supposed to be vacuuming right now, but yeah, you'll see his tail there. So um, Ben Robel, I work uh, as Director of Communications at Village Capital. Um, I think my career has had a through line around the idea of, of um, making sure people have a voice at the table. Um, I worked early on at the NAACP. Um, where I worked a lot on, on voting rights issues, criminal justice reform. Uh, and then I, I ended up working with uh, Stacey Abrams, New Georgia Project um, back in 2014 around, you know, democracy, voting rights issues um, down there. Um, and I joined Village Capital. It's an interesting organization. We're a global accelerator for social entrepreneurs. So we make investments, not grants. But um, we have this model for supporting startups. We, we let groups of entrepreneurs decide which of their peers should receive our funding. So we, we see decision-making power to the entrepreneurs that we that we support. And uh, we'll talk more about it, but um, really excited. So Meg and I met um, at a conference. We, we write about it in the book. Um, we were at a conference for impact investors in Amsterdam, and it was some of the wealthiest investors in the world talking about how they would solve the SDGs. And we realized that there were very few people from the communities that they were talking about in the room. It was mostly white, mostly male, mostly from the global global north. Um, and to be fair, you know, people recognize that. And, and the idea of the importance of lived experience came up a lot. Um, but we realized that the way that both philanthropy and and more and more impact investing work is very top down um, based on you know we can get into it but the Gates Foundation models we created in the 90s um, very donor centric um, and we sort of started to look into this um, world of participatory decision making and found a really cool history um, we also found some really great best practices which we'll get into but Meg maybe you can start with the history. So as Ben as Ben said, we're going to kick things off and just give a short history of um, participatory grant making, um, which goes back to the 1970s. Um, we're going to define the term term um, participatory grant making and understand what it means in a practical sense, and then look at some examples and strategies for uh, moving up the ladder of participation, which is a euphemism that we'll explain later on. Um, but to kick things off, we are going to start at um, an unexpected place, uh, Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, it was here in the, um, in the 1960s that a young man named George Pillsbury was a student, and he was from the Pillsbury 
family of Pillsbury Doughboy fame. And in fact, that ad campaign had just launched in 1964. So his family was even wealthier than they had been before. Um, this is George Pillsbury with some amazing lapels. Um, as a student at Yale, uh, uh, George was a little uncomfortable with all of the wealth that his family um, that his that came with being part of his family. They um, they went back several generations. They had buildings named after them, and but that the idea that he would just sort of inherit that wealth and then decide you know what to do with it. He was comfortable with that level of power. Um, so, and there's even a famous story about how as a Yale student, he went um, at the crack of dawn to the Black Panther headquarters in New Haven and left them a bag of money um, as an anonymous donation. He didn't, um, his whole approach what to philanthropy, which we'll get into, um, as a, as a student in the 60s, he was obviously very um, motivated by the war in Vietnam and the civil rights movements and was committed to that versus, um, you know, the naming a building after after him, after him himself. But he also um, wanted to in interrogate the power dynamics a little bit. So after his graduation from Yale, um, George Pillsbury connected with uh, a number of other uh, trust fund heirs from some of the leading companies in the US at that time who were in the same boat as him. They were young. They had maybe been part of activism on their respective college campuses. They were inheriting all of this money and wanted to give it away um, using a process that was different from the way that their parents had approached giving. Um, and there were two pillars to their approach, uh, which sort of forms the history of um, modern participatory grant making. Uh, this quote from George Pillsbury, our parents give to the symphony, we give to the symphony tenants organizing project, speaks to what they funded. They wanted to fund social justice causes. They wanted to fund activists who were um, agitating for change, which was a departure from philanthropy, um, which up until that point had been mostly focused on funding institutions. Uh, the second pillar is what we'll be focusing on today, with it, which is participatory grant making. Um, so they not only wanted to challenge the idea of what they should be giving to, but how they should be doing that giving. They didn't want to have donors making all of the decisions. So in the 1970s, um, George founded the Haymarket People's Fund. Um, it was headquartered in Boston, and it was a fund for um, for change makers around New England. And it was him turning over the money he was inheriting to be granted out. And this um, Haymarket was part of a network called the Funding Exchange, which included other funds in other US cities, including New York, Minneapolis, Los Angeles, all over the country um, by his, his peers who were also inheriting, um, who were also inheriting money from trusts. And, um, and the Haymarket People's Fund still exists today, um, but they were at their, kind of at their height, um, in the 70s and 80s. Um, so this is a little bit about how they were structured differently. And we're gonna talk more about the ladder of participation later on in the presentation, but there were eight, um, eight committees made up of people from the different communities that they wanted to support, um, who all gave recommendations for grantees to Haymarket staff who then made the grants. It was a bottom-up model as opposed to a top-down model, which made it very distinct. Um, here's a few of the other uh, funding exchange members. Again, many of these funds are still active today, although the funding exchange as a network um, uh, hasn't been around since I believe the early 2000s, even though the funds have survived it. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Ben now to um, talk a little bit about, um, about kind of where, where, how we got from this um, bubble up of excitement about these new funds in the 70s to where we are today. Thanks, Meg. Um, and we'll finish up this story and then get into defining PGM. So um, the Haymarket People's Fund and these other funding exchange local funds, these were all neighborhood based at the at the most. They were um, a city um, and they um, they just start to get a bit of attention. Um, and again, they had two pillars. Uh, pillar one was about social justice philanthropy, which was you know pretty new at the time. Pillar two was about participatory ground making that the how. So the what and the how. Um, and over the next really couple of decades, they started to, uh, George and some of his peers started to go out 
and um, argue with, you know, or debate and, and make a case for their style of philanthropy. They would go on the Phil Donahue show, which is what you're seeing here with these incredible 70s and 80s uh, fashion. Um, they would write books about why they believed in doing things the way they would do. And um, go to the next slide. Um, yeah, they basically said that they wanted to influence larger, wealthier foundations. And so it's maybe worth looking at, you know, so what happened? How did that, how did that work out? Um, and uh, for 25 years, really, not much happened. Uh, these funds continue to thrive. You know, the Paymarket People's uh, Fund or the Liberty Hill Fund in Los Angeles are some of the, you know, they, they have fun they funded uh, early work around LGBT rights and the AIDS epidemic and, um, you know, all criminal justice reform things years before anyone else was. Um, but as far as influencing larger foundations, it didn't really take on. Part of that is culture. Part of that is, um, really the challenge of getting people together in a room to to talk about how to um, make grants. And of course, what changed was the internet. Um, in the late 2000, 2000s, um, a couple of different participatory grant making uh, funds were created that took more of a national and global approach. So the Case Foundation, founded by AOL founder, um, you know, uh, Steve and Gene Case, um, they created a, a participatory pr uh, project called Make It Your Own, where people around the country could use the internet uh, to uh, decide on where uh, civic engagement dollars would go. Um, a couple of years later, uh, Wikipedia was launched and the Wikimedia Foundation, which was originally just getting grants from their offices in San Francisco, uh, they were inspired by some of these earlier examples and they decided to create a, to really just transition their funding model, their brand new foundation to a fully transparent participatory model. And there's to this day, the largest global participatory grant maker. You can imagine it, it functions a lot like Wikipedia where anyone can um, create a grant by creating a page. Anyone can review a grant by commenting on that page. And it's, it's very, you know, wiki, uh, wiki centric. Um, so, so the internet really helped expand and, and bring back the idea of participatory grant making. And, and that brings us to, to today. So a decade later, um, there's a lot of uh, participatory grant making going on in the world. I, I think a lot is, is a qualified term. Uh, this is something that is growing. And uh, you're seeing large foundations uh, doing it, MacArthur Foundation experimenting with it, which we'll talk about later, um, Forward and Open Society funding a lot, uh, so re-granting to a lot of smaller community-led funds. Um, on the neighborhood level, they, a lot of these funds are still around, and some newer ones like the Brooklyn Community Foundation are really pioneering new um, community-driven models. Uh, family foundations, um, there's a new generation, uh, next gen folks coming in and taking over boards over the next few years. And a lot of them have read Winners Take All, you know, by Anand Girdardis or uh, Edgar Villanueva's book. And he was kind enough to write the intro for our book um, and decide they want to maybe change the, the how of their of their foundations. Um, and then we'll define this now, I guess, community led foundations. It's a it's a bit of a term of art, but but foundations that were created or funds that were created for the sole purpose of being participatory. And for instance, Red Umbrella was, I think, launched up by Open Society. Uh, I think Disability Rights Fund was spun up by Ford Foundation. I might have that slightly off, but um, these are often, it's a pot of money given to activists to create an activist-led fund. And we can, we can talk about some of those examples. Um, so the next slide, I wanted to just give a couple more examples. Um, you know, these funds are working on pretty much participatory funds or, or participatory programs within a larger foundation um, are working on all sorts of issues. Uh, climate justice, um, you know, if any, if there are questions on sort of specific issues, we'd love to get in the weeds about some of these later on. Um, but um, with climate, you know, climate action, a lot of participatory funds are, are helping make sure that the community, the, the communities most affected by climate change are making decisions about, you know, what they need around resilience and adaptation. Um, on the health equity side, you know, Disability Rights Fund is, is a really important voice for disability rights activists around the world. The Red Umbrella Fund is, is for sex workers who, you know, are struggling to get funding for health work. Um, uh, you know, we can go on and on, but we'll talk about some of these funds later. Um, and I think I'm going to pass it back to Meg right now. Uh, thank you, Ben. So now we want to get into the nuts and bolts of what is participatory grant making. Um, uh, participatory grant making, it's an approach to funding that involves seeding decision-making power about grants to the very communities impacted by funding decisions. 
Um, we just traced the history of it. And I did want to note here that um, what we're describing is modern institutional participatory grant making. There's a history of participatory giving practices in a number of indigenous cultures and an African-American culture that goes way further back. Uh, that wasn't the focus of our book. We kept it, as I said, to modern institutions, but I encourage you to do, um, do some reading about it if the history portion is interesting to you. Um, so, um, so participatory grant making. Um, so with this approach, uh, sometimes it can be taken as a question of staff diversity. Um, and while yes, staff diversity is important, it's important to have um, people representing a number of different demographics and identities on staff, um, really what participatory grant making gets at is accountability. Um, how are you um, accountable to the communities that your grants are intended to serve? Um, and who is, who is part of that conversation and who is, um, who is part of the conversation versus who is kind of um, seen as a passive recipient? Um, that's the real, that's the, um, that's the question at the heart of participatory grant making. Um, another essential feature of this approach is um, how lived and learned experience are valued. Uh, lived experience is um, firsthand intimate knowledge. Um, we all have lived experience of our, our gender, our race, our sexual orientation, our religion, um, and in a much lower stakes way, being you know part of like a sports fan community or you know maybe growing up in a particular neighborhood. Uh, learned experience is knowledge that we gain through academic study, um, professional experience, where we're not having, it's not directly happening to us, but we're studying how it happens to other people or to systems. And both types of experience are real, they are valid. Um, what participatory grant making does is put learned experience and lived experience on the same level. They're they're both equally valuable. They're just simply representing different types of knowledge. Um, and traditionally learned experience is where all of the, all the weight, um, all of the gravitas is centered. Um, so why engage in participatory grant making? Um, in our book, we outline what we call the inside case and the outside case. Um, the inside case comes from the uh, School of Strategic Philanthropy that participatory grant making is more effective because that um, engaging the community who's going to ultimately be benefiting from the grant, that improves the odds of success. Um, they have skin in the game, they've been able to share their needs, and, um, and that ultimately not, not only leads to a more successful program, but creates capacity building opportunities. Um, the outside case is more of a moral one that it puts marginalized people and communities in charge of their own futures. Uh, therefore, it's more equitable and more ethical. Um, so though, and depending on who you're talking to, one or more case might, might be, end up being the more persuasive one. But those, um, that's, where, that's where those uh, conversations fall. Um, and I'm going to uh, just go through uh, sort of the, the practical decision points for participation before I hand it over to Ben to go into a little more detail. So in the um, so um, throughout the grant making process, we identified four opportunities to integrate participation. Uh, the first is setting a theory of change uh, where um, where a fund, uh, you know, an entire foundation or a particular pot of money where you're defining the problem and hypothesizing about the solution who is participating in that conversation how how is the community being um, made part of that uh, the second stage is sourcing and vetting ideas so this is how um, grant um, how potential grantees are being um, are being considered how they're being reached how they're being considered and what role the community plays maybe in setting that criteria or, um, or bringing in organizations that may not have been top of mind into the fold uh, there's a lot written, as I'm sure you're aware, about um, invite-only grants and the challenges that that can create in terms of um, uh, prioritizing larger, more well-funded nonprofits. We we won't get into that discussion here, but that's the point where that um, where that becomes relevant. Uh, this piece, um, the third decision point is making the funding decision itself. So deciding who gets the grants, whether that's part of a committee or um, a rating system, whatever the case may be. Um, there's an argument to be made that this is um, the 
the purest form of participatory um, grant making, that it's the community actually making that decision. Um, and um, there's again, we could we could talk a lot about that, and we will we will get into it a little bit later in the presentation. Um, and then the last piece is monitoring evaluation, and this is um, this is where communities are part of defining success and um, identifying ways that success can be measured that are in line um, that are in line with what the um, grant makers goals are, and just ensuring that alignment and ensuring that. Um, people are appropriately engaged and heard. So I'll turn it over to you, Ben, for the ladder of participation. Sure. Um, so the ladder of participation is a model. It's one of many models. I'm sure some of you have seen other models. Uh, this one was created by a woman a social scientist named Sherry Arnstein in 1969. She worked for, I believe, the Johnson administration, and she was working on integrating uh, hospitals in the South. So really had to get community buy-in for some pretty um, pretty um, dramatic policy shifts. And um, she came up with this model that, again, has been adapted to a lot of different formats um, of looking at how is a community, in this case, she uses the word citizen, um, but it could be a community of, uh, again, of a neighborhood. It could be a community of a of, a, of, of an identity group um, in the case of, for instance, the Disability Rights Fund, how, how much power does a community have um, in making a decision? So when you apply this to, uh, to, to the four steps we just laid out, um, at the very bottom is non-participation. So maybe just yes, non-participation um, where you're simply saying, you know, here is where, where folks are passive recipients of the decision. So here is what we're going to do. Um, moving up is the, the term she uses tokenism. We like to say consulting or listening because I think tokenism assumes not best intent. And a lot of times there is, you know, good intent, but it's a, a matter of listening and maybe doing a, a feedback session, but not having any real teeth to the rules around how community voice ultimately affects the final, the final call. Um, and then finally, uh, citizen power, um, you know, the highest level of, of participation is where stakeholders, um, anything from um, sharing in power to literally giving full control over to communities. Um, we'll say right off right here that most of the participatory processes that we have seen are, are not at the highest level. They're at the second highest level. Um, they, they are shared decision making between traditional foundation staff or donors and the community members, uh, although there are some examples of, of that highest level. Um, so the latter participation again, uh, non-participation, consulting, listening, and uh, community power. Um, so maybe if we go to the next slide, I think we're at the poll. Oh, no, not quite yet. So just just to just to go over this again, I know it's funny. There's two axes, but um, there's sort of the the, chron the chronological timeline of making decisions, and you know this is a this is an abstracted view of it. But you know these these four general categories, you can invite community members to be part of your foundation either conversations when you're spinning up your foundation or you're spinning up a new program, um, you know, what is the problem we're solving is, you know, if you don't get that problem right, you know, you might be off course. Um, you can involve community members in um, sending over applicants and making sure that the criteria are not overly restrictive, you know, um, thinking about um, about languages, about, you know, about different cultural considerations. Um, like Meg was saying, the most direct form of participatory grant making is to ask community members uh, to, to create, for instance, the Disability Rights Fund has a board of uh, a, a grant making board. Um, they actually have two levels of committees and in both levels, um, people with disabilities are 50% um, of, so activists with disabilities are 50% of the decision makers. Um, and then finally monitoring and evaluation, um, both setting uh, M&E targets and also um, tracking them, you know, having, folks with lived experience go out in the community and, and um, make sure that the information you're gathering is, is proper, is, is correct. Um, and I think this is where we have a poll. And I will say this this poll is kind of tricky because it's where do you think you, you sit on the ladder? And of course, um, there are four steps, right? There's the there's the chronology. So so just try to answer, you know, broadly speaking, where does your grant making process fall? If you have yeah. any part of that process that's you know community power, great, and and feel free to to to, to say to say that. Yeah, yeah. There's 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 no shame here. I mean, this is we're talking about this as a movement that's growing. So we we don't really we don't expect a ton of you know community power, community power just yet. Great. 
Great. Yeah, this is um as we um as we did research for the book, this is this is also frankly the breakdown that we were finding that you know there was a lot um as as Ben said, we we prefer to call that second stage consulting because gen we genuinely saw those um saw those practices being done in good faith. And part of it is an awareness issue and part of it is a how to issue, uh, which will which we will get into. Um, but you know, the point is we're all learning and um, we're going to go over some of the opportunities to um, uh, begin making um, how to approach changes in your grant making process. Great, thank you. So, how to move up the ladder? Um, so, how do how does a philanthropy move up the ladder? Um, we are going to talk about two examples um, of, of of foundations that have done this and. What I like about the examples we've chosen here is that they represent pretty different ends of the philanthropy spectrum. Um, we're gonna start with the MacArthur Foundation, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, very well-known uh, foundation in, based in Chicago. And they, um, they have a grant-making program for arts organizations in Chicago where they're based. And they discovered that um, the vast majority of their grants were being made to organizations in majority white parts of the city, mostly white and wealthy, and they wanted to change this. And they started by contracting with a local nonprofit who was plugged in with the, um, with the art scene um, across the city, including in neighborhoods that they hadn't been engaging and they worked with them to uh, create a community board re um, representing that was um, demographically representative of the neighborhoods in Chicago where that they wanted to support. And they ran a pilot just for this particular, um, just for this particular grant program. Um, the pilot went really well and it ended up, um, and one of the ripple effects it had was that it, they updated um, some of their grantee criteria across other programs to center equity. So they took some learnings from this pilot and were able to apply it to other programs where they weren't necessarily um, piloting a participatory process, but they were um, taking those lessons learned and applying them elsewhere. And they continue to run this um, uh, to run this process for this particular um, arts grant making program, and they continue to iterate on it and improve on it. Uh, the uh, two of the leaders at MacArthur have written some really interesting blog posts on their experience that um, I would encourage you to to look into if you want more detail on how they approached it. But we were really impressed with the way that they um, that they approached this, knowing that you know they still had a lot to learn, and um, and were able to not only learn but start applying that knowledge. Yeah. Um, the next uh the next fund that we're going to talk about is mama cash and this is this is a lesser known fund than macarthur uh, mama cash is a feminist fund that's headquartered in amsterdam um, but makes grants all over the world they were established in the early 1980s and they joined um in 2014 they joined a donor collaborative it was a group of other uh, grant makers that served uh, women and girls and they um, had a participatory way of um, of uh, of making grants from their shared pot of money. They had a really positive experience with that collaborative. So they hired a consultant to do something similar to what MacArthur did and test out a participatory grant making process in one of their grant programs. And when that went really well, they said, you know what, we want to go all in on this idea. We want to partner. Um, we want to do this across all of our grant making. So again, they partnered with um, the organizations in their network, um, peer funders, uh, current and former grantees to scale this idea to all their grant making programs. And when we spoke to their um, leadership, they talked about how it really helped them. They, it re-envisioned their roles that they said that their staff prior to this um, Shift had been in largely kind of analytical roles, um, managerial roles, and this shifted to more facilitation roles. So they were able to help retrain their staff and hire new staff that had this different um, this different set of skills because they were still facilitating the process. Um, they were helping the um, the community members that um, were now part of their grant making process participate effectively. And it um, it just shifted um, it shifted their thinking on you know what their role was as a fund. 
So um, I should, and I should mention, you know, they are, Mama Cash is a smaller fund. I want to say that they, they are about a $10 million fund. So certainly not on the scale of MacArthur, which makes that shift um, a bit more straightforward. But um, the fact that they, you know, um, foundations of both these sizes have been able to pilot this is really, really encouraging and shows, um, yeah, shows that we're off to a really exciting start in spreading spreading this model. Uh, are we ready to get into Q&A? Yes, or, if you oh, are. Oh, okay. Yeah, so let's do one more, just one more slide. I think, um, yeah, q and I think I would love to, if you want to start, maybe putting questions into the chat. just wanted to show this last bit. Um, there are a couple of different ways, you know, we, we've given a couple examples. There's a couple of different ways to get involved in participatory grant making. The first is, by the way, to read this report um, from this incredible organization that's hosting us. Um, I think there's literally, um, like, I've marked up this copy. This was one of the major inspirations for our book, written by Cynthia Gibson and Jen Bokoff with, um, with a lot of support. Um, has some, it's a very practical guide on how to do participatory grant making. And if you go to their website, there's about 10 um, PDFs that have like Q and A um, details about how the, the mechanisms of various participatory funds and how they work. And they ask the same question to all these different funds. Um, but let's say you just want to get started. Um, so one thing you could do is um, if you're not quite ready to actually do participatory grant making yourself, but you're interested in exploring it and learning about it, you could explore a donor collaborative. Um, one example of a donor collaborative is the With and For Girls Collective. Um, we that mentioned Mama that. Mama Cash's, uh, yeah. Um, oh, is that, yeah, I think Mama Cash was in that. Yeah, um, a couple other Mama participatory Cash. funds were in that. But uh, but there were also some, I think the, um, the fund that does the noses, that, that Red Nose Day uh, was in it, Comic Relief was in it, and um, some family foundations, the Malala Fund, and they all came together, and some of the local participatory activist-led funds created a participatory process. Some of the larger funds provided the money. Um, they hired a staff and they ran, you know, they funded um, feminist activists around the world. And so the, you know, the larger funds or the more established funds um, didn't have to, you know, go to their board and, and explain, you know, here's here's the, the change in our process. Um, if you do want to go to your board and maybe you're a board member and, and want to go to your peers um, and talk about, you know, changing the how of your processes, um, you know, there's a couple things you could do to, to sort of get that started. You could run a participatory audit. Um, there are some people creating a, a real audit with tool, which is really exciting. But in the meantime, um, you can just sort of look around at your different processes and map them out, you know, on the on the ladder and use that as a conversation tool um, for your peers, for your colleagues um, and look for opportunities to uh, move up the ladder in, in at various points in your process. Um, you could form a community advisory committee. I'm sure many of you already have something along this along these along this line. Um, I would imagine, yeah, I would imagine a lot of you already do. But I think that this would be a really interesting conversation to bring to that committee and and have a conversation. Um, and you could also just pilot. Um, you know, Mama Cash didn't go 100% participatory in one day. They they piloted a process and they, and they built it out. Um, and we just wanted to put down here again. We can get into this in the Q and A and. I'm also happy to sort of chat offline, um, but there are a couple different models um, that folks use uh, uh, to build participatory funds. In a lot of ways, you're you're creating you're just creating the rules of a game, and it's a game with stakes and consequences. But you are building um, a structure for how money gets out the door. And one um, one way to do this is a community board, where you say, you know, we have this amount of money, we've decided it's going towards this purpose, and we're going to ask a, a series of community members. With lived experience, how they want to um, give that money away. Um, it's always a good idea to sort of have regular rolling off and rolling on of that board um, to ensure representation. Um, another option is a rolling collective. Um, one example of this is Frida, the Young Feminist Fund, where again they were spun up by I believe Ford Foundation um, and a couple of other foundations. They created this fund that has a, if not an endowment, at least you know enough money for a few years. Um, and it's run by, so everyone involved in the fund is, uh, is a woman or a woman identifying person under the age of 30 who is an activist for feminist causes around the world. And at any given point, the two president, co-presidents are activists. Um, and every grant cycle, the previous grantees uh, decide who should get grants the next time around. So again, the previous grantees, in addition to getting funding, they also learn 
how to play the role of grant maker. And they sort of, you know, they put on the shoes of a grant maker and therefore they learn what a grant maker is looking for. And of course they have the power to decide which of their fellow activists should get their funding. Um, closed collective is a bit like that, but a little more complex. Um, and, and there are some really great resources out there that will just lay out the different models. Um, we can get into some of it in, um, in Q and A. Um, but just wanted to lay out a couple different ways to approach um, pathways to participatory grant making. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I think now, uh, Yvonne, we can turn to Q&A and um, there's so much, to, <laughs> there's so much that's not in this presentation that is in our book. So we're really eager to hear your questions and dive into some of the, some of the particulars of all of these different models. Okay, will do. First of all, can you repeat the name of the, the Candid or Foundation Center um, guy that you had there? Uh, it's called Deciding Together. Deciding Together, and I'm gonna see if I can find the link or we'll see if we can find the link on our end to put in there. So Deciding Together, that was one question people had. And then a really good question from Delia that I wanted to start with. Um, Delia wanted to know, how can funders communicate the greater effectiveness of participatory grant making without overburdening grantees hmm. um, or PG committees with reporting requirements? Uh, that is a really good question. Um, ben, I have some thoughts and then I can hand okay. off to you. Um, it, it goes back a little bit to what we were talking about with the um, with the mama cash model that the idea isn't, you know, doing the equivalent of dropping a giant stack of papers in front of grantees and saying, here you go, fix it. Um, you know, it's, you're in charge now. It's um, it's really building, it's building trust and then it's facilitating that process in a way that grantees um, that grantees and community members are supported. And I'm not sure if the question is about um, grantees who are involved in the selection process or just in general. Um, one, thing, um, one thing with re reporting requirements is that a lot of the participatory funds that we profiled um, did try to minimize those requirements into what was truly necessary to understand, um, you know, to understand the effectiveness of the grant, uh, but I might, um, ben, do you want to weigh in on this? I think that's a good answer. Yeah. yeah. One other, uh, oh, one other note on that, and uh, we didn't mention this in the presentation, but in terms of engaging community members, um, we talked about, you know, valuing lived and learned expertise and um, a practice in participatory grant making that is strongly, highly encouraged, if not essential, is compensating community members for their time. Um, that is, you know, you are, you are after all like using their expertise. So the same way you'd pay a consultant to, you know, redesign your technology systems, you should be compensating, um, community members for offering their insights on what, you know, what services would best serve their community. So that's, um, so that's also another piece of, um, how you relate to grantees is just understand, you know, valuing their time and valuing their expertise, both in terms of how the trust you've built and how that relationship works, but also in terms of, you know, fair compensation for their work. I love that. I've definitely heard that. Have you seen um, that work or have you seen that in practice, the compensation of, of grantees? Yeah, we um, definitely, and, and it varies how it's done. This might be a good time to plug. There's this uh, community of practice that we're a part of called the Participatory Grant Making Community of Practice, and you can find them participatorygrantmaking.org. Um, it's a Slack community, Google listserv, and folks come to the community with exactly that kind of question. Um, I'm trying to remember, someone asked that a couple weeks ago, and there were like 10 responses for how different people compensate their grantees. Um, some mm -hmm. were doing more of like the $25 an hour. Some of them were just going for like $75 an hour or $300 for a day because you know, you're know you a foundation, you're just deciding how the money goes and this is a, this is a valuable part of the process. Um, the, yeah, I mean, the 100% the of, um, of the people responding did compensate. Um, and um, again, I, I don't have a number for you, but I think that um, you wanna at least you know provide like you pay anyone and then consider even going higher because again, you like, like the last question we referred to, you, you know, you're asking folks to take time out of their day. They might be taking time off work. They, you know, they might be taking time off taking care of their, their family. Um, so, yeah. 
Thanks so much. Um, we have a question from Jerry. Jerry says, we are a new organization just developing our grant making process. How can we successfully embed PGM into those processes from the outset and get the right input slash insights we have when we have no history? Interesting. Um, I'd be curious just quickly if like what kind of foundation, if you can get that information, if they're, uh, if they're like a local versus an issue based, but yeah, Meg, you wanna, you wanna start that? Yeah, I was going to say for if it's a place based foundation, um, the Brooklyn Community Foundation, we do a case study yeah. of them in the book and they're an amazing example. Um, they uh, they were basically created um, after the um, after the financial crisis um, to be a community foundation for Brooklyn. And as part of that process, they did a they did a massive survey of the different communities in Brooklyn, which is as most of you know, one of the mo one of the most diverse uh, geographically concentrated. <laughs> it's got it's one of the most diverse populations in the world, right? Concentrated in this one single borough of New York City, and they asked that question of the residents: what they thought their priorities should be, um, what is what they felt were the biggest issues in Brooklyn, and they made them made the community part of the process. So I would look, I mean, we have a case study in letting go. They also have some information on their website that I would point you towards, but they've had a very, um, they really centered the community in the way that they built their process and they um, did, you know, they, um, they've also scaled their participatory grant making from um, a few programs to most, if not all of their programs at this point. Um, and they've done that over, I, I guess it's been about 10 years since they were established. So it was still, it, you know, it, um, they, yeah, they've been around about a decade, but setting up that process, it took a couple of years and I don't know where, where you are in that, but, um, but it was a sort of diligence that really paid off and really built trust with the people that they were trying to serve. Thank you. Uh, Tina wants to know, do you have recommendations for resources, toolkits on engaging underrepresented communities? So the mechanics, yeah. I mean, it kind of gets to what, I was gonna also give another example, and I think I'll, I'll touch on this question. Um, so Meg gave a great example of a local place-based foundation, an example of a, um, a sort of a started from scratch, um, you know, issue-based foundation would be the Disability Rights Fund. And the story there um, is that a couple, 10, 10 plus years ago, the uh, United Nations created a new um, a treaty on, on disability rights. And they did this really radical thing where they saved one third of the seats in the UN committee room for disability rights activists. And that actually ended up working out really well. There were some interesting, um, you know, issues with the original language that the activists caught. And that inspired a number of philanthropists to say, hey, you know, we would we want this kind of community engagement to continue. Let's create a fund that is called the Disability Rights Fund and, and is, you know, com community driven. And so one of the questions they had to approach early on was, well, well, who who is going to make decisions? Is disability, the disability community are, you know, by some metrics, 15%, I think, of, of the world can identify as, as being disabled. And I believe what they did was they um, contracted with a third party, an umbrella group called the International Disability Alliance. And they, every year that they run their, their, their cycle, they ask the International Disability Alliance to nominate um, some board members. And again, they, they sort of um, roll, roll on and off in order to make sure that it's representative. Um, so yeah, they, they worked with, an, with a third party. I know when MacArthur went to the community, they worked with a third party, right? A, um, a local foundation or maybe activist leader who recommended. So I, I think, um, you know, there's definitely a risk there if you're gonna go to sort of the activists that you already know, and, and that's always an issue with representation where, you know, there's always gonna be the louder activists or, you know, the community member that's, their story is always used and there's a, there's a risk of a lead capture of the activists there. Um, but I, I, I also think that if you're careful about that kind of thing, um, it's, it's, it's okay to partner um, on that kind of thing. Yeah, and this is also a good, a good time to note the, um, you know, this is where it's, that trust building is important. So it's understanding which, um, which organizations or people have already built trust with the community that you wanna serve, and then, building trust with that, I guess, intermediary organization, if you if it's not already there. 
Um, we begin the book by talking about um, Mark Zuckerberg's donation to the Newark school systems, where he basically he had a bunch of consultants kind of parachuted into Newark and their efforts at engaging um, at engaging the community consisted basically of like town halls where it was clear that they already knew what they were going to do and they were letting people say things. But as we talked about in the ladder of participation, there were no real teeth attached. And so even people just lost faith in that process overall. And obviously a whole other mess, mess unfolded um, that there's another book written about. But I think um, I think what's really essential is is building that trust and identifying where um, where you can pinpointing okay these are these are the people that I'm trying to reach who do they have faith in and how do I build trust with that person so that it can be a it can grow into something that really truly serves this community and make clear that this isn't just you know an exercise in box ticking this is really we're committed to this for the long haul. Thank you. Another question um, we have from, I want to make sure we got this one, from Dave. When creating a participatory grant making committee of local community members who will make funding decisions, what best practices did you see for identifying slash recruiting the right people? Thoughts on how to de-bias the selection process? Uh, that is a really, really good question. Um, I know that there are some insights in the Deciding Together report. In terms of what we saw from, um, and we did something like 200 interviews for this book, I know that one thing that we kept coming back to was what Ben described with the Disability Rights Fund was having sort of a rolling in, rolling out of, um, of community members, especially for groups like the disabled community, which you know, there's all different types of disabilities. There's all different identities that can intersect with disability. So having, you know, people serve like two year terms and then cycle out or whatever the case may be, um, setting up that process was really important. Uh, ben, I don't know if you have yeah. other other ideas here. Yeah, I was gonna say that. And also um, the rolling collective model, the uh, rolling collective, uh, Frida, you know, where each round of grantees reviews the following round. Um, if you're starting from scratch, then that would um, that would involve having one round of grantees that you are selecting, um, and then you know that group has been vetted. That group is uh, hopefully diverse, and um, there might be a case to be made that in that case you want to do smaller grants to more people, so that you know you're these are get to know you grants, and you're able to make some you know, make some mistakes or, or just, you know, build relationships and figure it out as you go along. And then that group could ultimately become or a subset of that group of, of, of grant makers, of uh, grantees, um, presumably activists or community leaders in the community, that group could then um, decide on the next round. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thomas wants to know, how do you conduct a participatory audit? So um, she might be here, Diana Samaras, and she, so the former head of Disability Rights Fund and the former head of the Wikimedia Foundation are building a model, like an actual tool, which we're really excited about. Um, but I don't think it's ready yet. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would say we've done this with some folks, you know, we've attended some board meetings and, and just, you know, given a similar presentation and then just done, I, you know, board meeting is a good time to do it, but really any all staff meeting is a good time to do it. Um, we would literally say, you know, let's look at your grant making process or let's like, you know, maybe the pre work for this meeting is to if you run a grant making process, you know, write down what are the steps in that process or, you know, bring whatever document you have and then review this ladder of participation and just do something like we did today where you say, well, where are we? Um, and, you know, again, we we've learned by doing this a couple of times, you probably want to do some prep work and have one really good example of like one program where you do a good job, one program where maybe you don't to a great job or one program mm -hmm. where you've improved and um, use that conversation to educate your, because um, again, you're you're doing the audit, you're educating your staff. I think it's all part of the process. Thank you. We know that a lot of our, our funders aren't these, you know, huge places. So Candace's question speaks to that. Um, Candace says, do you have any examples of participatory grant making where there are a high volume of applications with only one or two staff to facilitate? Um, I, 
I, I, I'm trying to think of the, I'm thinking through the different processes that we profiled and that, that, that don't, that's, none of the conversations we had that, that concern didn't come up that I can recall. Um, I do know that in Red Umbrella Fund and a few others, the staff was playing, the role that staff was playing where they have like a rolling collective model similar to Frida, staff often played the role of, you know, they were all, they were screening for eligibility, you know, if they are restricted to a certain geographic area or a certain, you know, organizations of a certain size or budget, um, the staff would do screening just based on those, you know, kind of baseline qualifications. And then the community, um, and then bring in the community members for the rest of the process. Um, but I'm like I'm kind of r rolling through the examples in my head, and I don't think we had um, anyone talk about you know our staff was completely overwhelmed in this way. It was definitely a transition to working, as we said, in more of a facilitator role versus an analytical one. But you know that was uh, something you know that that was a very you know just something that worked it, worked itself out. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah, but, you, know, you could also. Do you have anything to add? Yeah. I mean, you could look at that as an opportunity. I mean, certainly a challenging one, but an opportunity. Um, if you work at a mid size or larger foundation, especially a larger foundation, it's gonna you're gonna have to involve a lot of stakeholders and and educate a lot of stakeholders and and share this wonderful report with them um, and potentially change the way you do things. If you are smaller, if you are more, um, if you are more um, flexible. Um, then that's it's, it's it's easier right to create this um i i think that it sort of depends on what problem you're solving for if you know that you're very small and you know that you have more grantees than you can give uh real authentic you know feedback to and you know do more than just say no and really like you know make sure you're engaging them and encouraging them to apply again the following year if you recognize that these are problems i mean you need more people and if you don't have the money for that I, I do think that thinking about um community members as again not not just taking advantage of the community members but but saying this is just going to be this extra step we take and um who's going to review all of these extra grants we're going to ask folks with lived experience to do it and on the front end yeah it's more work it is uh, educating folks it is creating these processes but you know, compared to where we were five years ago, there are so many more practice, best practices, so many more resources. Um, you're not creating a, a whole model from scratch. You can you can sort of copy paste a lot of what's been done elsewhere. And I, I would look at it in, in some ways as an opportunity. Wonderful. Uh, Bridget wanted to help us out as a follow up to the previous question, comment, supporting the committee with participatory decision making is important. And um, Bridget points out the book by Sam Kainer, Facilitator's Guide to Participating, Participatory Decision Making. So if people uh, want to look that up and Ebony may mm -hmm. throw the link. In the chat. Yeah. Is Thank that a, a resource you're familiar with as well? Maybe Meg, I hadn't heard of it. That's great. Actually, yeah, I've I've heard of it. Um, it's a great resource. Also, I don't know if my screen is visible, but I have um, we have links um, in the slide deck to some of these um, to some of the resources that we've mentioned. Okay, perfect. So that'll be something they can click on in when they get the. Yeah. the perfect. Um, a question from Joni. We are an intermediary that provides grants to nonprofits who provide services to their communities. How would PGM work for us? So you could, like we were talking about with a rolling collective model, you could have nonprofit leaders. Um, it's an interesting question about whether it would be the, the CEO or you know the, the some other point of contact there, but you could have nonprofit leaders you know, be part of the uh, decision making process. Um, yeah, I mean, there's also. I might, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, go ahead, go ahead. I'm curious what you're going to say. <laughs> I was just going to say that um, if it's service provision um, involving the people that they are providing services to, like for example, if, you know, one of the services is shelters for um, people experiencing homelessness, then, you know, having an unhoused person on the committee that decides that, that, you know, make, helps decide, make those decisions, things like that. Um, any, and again, this sort of depends on the types of services provided. Uh, we do say in letting go that like with things like medical research, like that's one where like, 
yeah, you, the community that you want deciding that is a community of, you know, doctors and scientists, but in general, when it comes to, um, when it comes to social services, that you do you do want people who would ultimately be receiving those services to be involved along with you know the social workers or medical professionals or whoever is serving them um, because they are both they're going to both of those communities are going to have a lot of insights into um how the how their process is working and how they're able to serve people and um what else might have an impact in that area thank you so Lori probably represents a, a few people in our audience who are with nonprofits. Um, Lori says, how can an established 501c3 obtain grants from an established PGM, or can a nonprofit pilot a PGM locally and obtain funding from the PGM for a particular project? So that, that was, I was almost answering the first part of the question a minute ago, where when you think about nonprofits using participatory practices in their community, I think a lot of the same logic applies. It's just less about necessarily money going out the door and more about setting a theory of change and setting, you know, um, I mean, there's, there's, um, yes, setting just general day to day policies. Um, but how, so, so I think it would be fascinating. And, and, you know, we're talking about participatory grant making in a bit of a formal sense and, you know, as defined by large foundations like MacArthur, but, you know, mutual aid is a part of is a type of participatory grant making, and and there are some, you know, there are some more, um, some more maybe independent um, or sort of organizations like the International Trans Fund, I believe, um, is they just totally operate off of like PayPal, and and they're they're very loose, you know, with how they do things, and that's kind of part of their whole thing. They're like we, you know, if we brought the lawyers in, it would just be it would just be too complicated. So I'm not suggesting you, you know. But, but if you're a nonprofit, if you don't have like grant making capacities, if you literally want to just get one of these off the ground, use PayPal, you know, um, you know, start a listserv and yeah. do a small amount of money and test it out. I think that that's really exciting. You know, that idea that yeah. across our economy, across philanthropy and across sort of the social sector, there's this de democratization of decisions. Um, I would say just try stuff out with a small amount of money and, and see what works. Yeah. And in terms of um, of receiving money from participatory process, um, you know, there's still um, depending on what community you serve and what types of grants you typically get. Um, there's there's Ben, I'm now blanking on the number. There's there's a lot of participatory funds out there, and they, most likely there is one that um, is designed to serve um, serve your issue or your geographic area. And so it's worth. Um, and when you apply for that process, depending on how they're set up, you need then, you know, become really intimately involved, which, you know, can open up a lot of different doors. Um, yeah. Okay. Jerry wants you to talk more about DCT slash guaranteed income overlay with participatory grant making. Um, Sites Up Together is one organization we're beginning to work alongside. So would that be like um, like a universal basic income or direct transfer? Is that? Is it's, it, it says DCT. I'm not sure. Jerry might have to uh, elaborate for us. Oh, conditional cash transfers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe that is um, yeah conditional cash transfers, which is a form of universal so basic income. Yeah. So one. Um, so the fund that Ben was talking about is a really interesting example of this. Um, I believe it's the Trans Justice Funding Project, not International Trans Fund, um, although perhaps they do it too. But basically what Trans Justice Funding Project does is they're incorporated as a trust fund instead of as a 501c3 or even as a for-profit um, for because what they the role that they serve is you know they take in they take in funding from donors and they also have like a benefactor who's Kind of a modern day George Pillsbury, um, but they get requests from trans led organizations around the country. And when we interviewed one of their leaders, um, she made the point that, like, sometimes it's like, hey, we are like a support group for trans people in Kansas. And really, what we need is like, you know, a few hundred dollars to rent the space for our weekly meetings, which, you know, and so they're like, why would we put them through a whole application process for that? As soon as we know that, like, it's a legit ask, we can just send the money via PayPal. And you could argue that's a form of conditional cash transfer. 
Um, there, I will say their setup is pretty unique. Um, I don't think in our research we found any other um, any others with that um, with that that were incorporated as uh, as trust funds. Um, I and now I'm trying to think if any of the participatory funds also do some form of universal basic income and. Yeah, I, I'm, no specific examples are coming to mind. I know that funding specific activists has come up, but it's usually that activist is usually backed by like an organization of some type, even if it's a small one. So it's still the entity that would be making the ask. I don't know if that answers your question. Gotcha. We'll we'll see if Jerry pops back in and asks. Um... Yeah. Something additional. Um, and speaking of examples, Eve wanted earlier on when you were talking, um, Eve said, "Can the host make real-world examples how to process how this process works in charities that help children?" Sure. Yeah, youth-led participatory grant making. Um, there's a whole bunch of passionate advocates for youth-led participatory grant making. Um, I don't know if we featured any in the book specifically, but I do know we talked well, one of our early inspirations for this book was, oh, Frida, yeah, yeah, and I guess, so. yeah, sure, Frida, Frida is young, young women um, and, and, and youth. Um, one example from the book was a participatory budgeting process. It's widely regarded as pretty successful. The um, Boston, why am I blanking, the, the Boston, um, it was in Boston, it was for school children, it was for teenagers um, who go to Boston public schools, and they, did a you know they had a barbecue they had the students come they they discussed different um what do you need in your school system let's let's you know i was like a hundred thousand dollars of the school budget and what do you want to do and they again they educated the students they they fed the students they narrowed down um some really complex ideas into simpler ideas um and ultimately the students chose um you expect them to choose you know like sports facilities facilities and things like that but they chose like air conditioning and heating because um, Boston city schools are like old buildings and it's really hard to focus on learning if you're cold or if you're hot. Um, so like that was a really cool example. I, I personally, maybe Meg, you know, I don't know a ton, but I know there's a lot written about youth led for career ground making and people to do it, absolutely love it. Yeah, yeah, Frida is the one that comes immediately to mind and they're, um, it's not strictly youth. I think it's I think it's um women and um women and non-binary people under 30. Uh but still, but that still falls in the youth led bucket. There's an um I think the participatory grant making community website actually lists some of the youth led ones. Um, but yeah, there there is a whole movement there. And um yeah, there's there's a lot more to be learned. I think when you're talking about like, you know, young children, then you know, the, the community you want to involve is like, you know, their caregivers and their teachers versus like for adding four year olds on a committee. But I don't think that's what you were suggesting. Um, Tina says, as a former Fed, I'm interested to know if you know if any part of the federal government is considering or interested in PGM or piloting any PGM initiatives. Um, I too am a former Fed, so I can give a teeny bit of an answer and then hand it off to Ben, who might also have ideas. Um, I worked for the Office of Management and Budget under President Obama, um, actually working on um, paper success projects, which is a way of um, tying um, tying payments to outcomes. Um, what we did see the, um, at the federal level. I saw a lot of and continue to see a lot of um, stuff on the consulting rung of the of the um, of the ladder, which which makes sense. You know, it is a democracy. There are you know opportunities to weigh in at different points. Um, with some of the specific initiatives um, in the Domestic Policy Council, there were like they did have like a youth advisory panel that would you know make proposals that I think on most part were accepted. There's there's obviously different considerations in government because you're ultimately implementing what Congress has legalized. And I'm talking about the federal level um, with state and local governments. There's other, you know, other um, other complicating factors. But at the federal level, like there I, I've seen that happen. Um, didn't see a whole lot of it under the previous administration. I don't know enough about what the Biden administration is doing at the moment, but um, I've seen a lot of a lot at the um, at the consulting level, less so at the um, at the community or citizens power level. Um, in terms of in terms of new initiatives. 
Um, it, yeah, and I'll just I'll add to that. I mean, the the phrase maybe Meg said of a participatory budgeting. Um, there oh, are God. hundreds of examples of participatory budgeting around the world, and uh, and a couple dozen cities in the U.S., including New York, um, have participatory budgeting processes. I know that the folks who run the participatory budgeting process definitely met with the Obama team and they talked about it and they was like, oh, that's interesting. I don't think that's, I don't think we're there yet. Um, I did find this uh, Black Lives Matter um, policy paper about um, how federal government can can put money towards um, participatory human rights budgeting processes. So encouraging the federal government to fund, you know, like we were talking about, fund an intermediary, um, which is I think a great way to approach this. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Linda says, budgeting as a whole. We have a we wrote our um, the epilogue about participatory budgeting and some of these questions um, about governments and participation. So, um, what's the name of the Josh Learners organization? Because that's definitely a great resource for. Um, they just changed their name. The the participatory budgeting. I'll, I'll look it up. Global okay. Hub for Participatory Democracy. Um, Thank you. Global uh, People Powered, the Global Hub for Participatory Democracy. Yeah. So People Powered is the name. Okay. Yes. Perfect. All right. Linda says, "I'm a grant writer for a small local nonprofit. We are trying to come at this from the perspective of including recipients of services in the CQI process for our programs. Do you have any thoughts on this?" A uh, CQI. I, I, I what was it? CQI. Yeah. Are I have to admit, I don't know what that acronym is. All right. We're all speaking in acronyms now. Um, but I, I guess uh, until we get what CQI is exactly, but being a grant writer for a small local nonprofit and trying to come from the perspective of including recipients, um, do you have any thoughts on that? The recipients of the services that yeah. get grant writing services? It looks like it's. Um, maybe continuous quality improvement or just, you know, how do you effectively, um, um, yeah, how do you per perform social services? So, I mean, our book was definitely not focused on providing social services. I mean, I think that starts to be a whole different, I, I don't know. And I, I don't, may maybe a lot of the principles would apply. I do know um, we've spoken in the process of, you know, promoting the book. I spoke with um, a woman who is a, a doctor. She um, works with young autistic children and they, see the, the, the children's hospital and they work with a lot of um, families and they a internal advisory board or rather family or like a task uh, a team um, that is figuring out how they can build a more how they can be more culturally sensitive to this community of their patients and their idea now we talked about it with her was to create a community advisory board of parents of these children from these communities. Um, again, this is not a radical idea to have community advisory board, but um, I mean, that's, that's you know, in general, if you can bring community members in, that's great. I think a lot of these advisory boards end up being more on the consulting or listening side of the ladder of participation. And any way that you can say, you know, we're going to let this advisory board, we're going to allow this advisory board to, you know, have a, a real decision with teeth. It's gonna be case dependent, but I think that's sort of what you should be looking for. Oh, great. And that's what Linda uh, clarified. Yeah, getting feedback on the services we provide and continuous quality improvement. So yeah, that, that is the answer they're looking for. Okay, and then you, you mentioned the barbecue. So this may be sort of an answer to this, but Vanessa says, what is a good way to introduce philanthropy, including the current challenges to community members on a participatory grant making committee? Introduce the so to get the community involved. I mean, make it fun, right? I, Meg, Meg, what's that book um, the, about um, intentional gatherings? Um, uh, Priya Parker's book. Um, the yeah, I think it actually might. I think the subtitle is the art of intentional gathering. Um, yeah, um, barbecues are a barbecues are, are a great opportunity. Um, meet, you know, meeting people rather than and sometimes rather than setting up a separate meeting, joining joining one that's already in progress. Um, again, offering like things like child making child care available if you're trying to, um, you know, if you're trying to involve, you know, people who might be parents or caregivers. So making making it very making their participation very easy and um, 
and I think really putting yourself in, in listening mode as, as you start that engagement and also um, as that relationship progresses, um, just making, you know, making it clear that, you know, you're not seeking their input again in more of a consulting way. Like you really, you want to find a, you want to find a role for them. You want them, you want them to be playing a role in this. You want them to have decisions that they make and um, that this isn't just, um, you know, that this isn't, this isn't just a one and done thing, that this is a long-term relationship. So yeah, make it fun. Um, see it as an opportunity to build relationships and just, you know, be sensitive to things like, um, like childcare, you know, if, what, what people's working hours might, might be. If there's a lot of people working in the service industry, for instance, then evenings might not be a great time for a meeting, um, stuff like that. And just to kind of build on that theme, I think, um, a lot, I mean, just getting back to the heart of what, what our book is about, there's a lot of mechanics of participatory ground making, but at the end of the day, it's about sort of treating members of the community you're trying to serve with respect and 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 sort of as equals. Um, so much of philanthropy implicitly is, you know, it's not us versus them, but it's us and them. It's, it's sort of, um, there is this artificial distinction between the people who, you know, are paid to hand money out and just the people who are just living their, their life. And I think that the, what I think is beautiful about participatory grant making is um, you're inviting folks who, you know, you didn't hire them. Like the, the, they haven't gone through all the gatekeeping of all the university systems that, you know, really is what it usually takes to get a job in philanthropy, but you're inviting folks into your office and saying, you know, I respect your opinion. I want to know what you have to say. And if, you know, I, you know, may, maybe don't wear a suit that day, right? Like maybe, um, you know, make it a little more informal. I think that there are these, these um, barriers that, um, philanthropy can be, can be intimidating and, and the idea of a foundation can be intimidating and some people don't trust Bill Gates and might apply that to all of philanthropy. So go out of your way to, you know, bring your whole self and to, to be authentic and to remember that, um, you know, that people might, um, want, might appreciate that. I love that. We um, when we teach about grant writing, we we talk about the asset framing approach and understanding that people had value before you got there. So um, I really like um, that idea to just meet people where they are, have a conversation, and, and involve them. You know, if this is about you, so why not? Um, Ryan wanted to let us know Exponent Philanthropy has had some sessions on participatory grant making, engaging community voices as a lean small staff funder. Um, so we'll see if we can find that and include it in the email if, if not in the chat right now. So exponent philanthropy. Um, and then I think that's it that we have for questions now. People like to you know pop them in, so I'll keep my eye on, on, on that. But what are your mm -hmm. kind of final thoughts on, I, I would imagine people want to know, you know how to get started or how to move up the ladder um, you know, right mm -hmm. after this call, what can they do? So what are your kind of final thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, well, you can start um, lettinggobook.org is the website for the book. You could order it there. We also have some resources uh, listed there. Um, we also, if you use the promo code CANDID, you can get 10% off the book. Uh, just plugging that real quick. Um, participatorygrantmaking.org, the community that, um, that Ben mentioned, the Deciding Together Guide. Um, ben, there's more. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the number one thing is um, over even buying our book, I would say, is participatorygroundmaking.org. Um, go to participatorygroundmaking.org. Um, you know, there's a there's a form. I think I've made the form. You know, you, like, literally, it's all volunteer-led. But um, send us your information, and then we will invite you to a Slack channel. You can be on it like, tomorrow. And then, you know, Slack us um, and say hi. Um, but you'll see, I mean, there's all of these chats. There's these channels, one channel is about I mean, there, one is about, there, there are all these different questions that people ask, you know, one is around collaboration, one is around monitoring and evaluation, um, one is called the reading room, and it's just interest, interesting readings on the topic. Um, so the website, participatorygroundmaking.org, has best practices and resources, but, um, you know, it's a small team, not hugely updated. I would say the Slack channel, you can be on this, you can start talking to people uh, tomorrow. Wonderful. So that that's pretty much a way to just, you know, ask questions right now and say, hey, how does this work? What are you doing? And get that instant feedback. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wonderful. Okay. I want to say how many members are there at this point? Something like 600? 
Yeah, oh, wow. I mean, it started off as 20 about a year and a half ago, and now it's 800. Um, and on Slack, there's like 450. Um, and it's, I mean, I've been in a lot of Slack channels, Slack communities that are not great. This one actually is, is pretty, um, pretty special. Awesome. And and I, I just because we use Slack here at Candid all the time. So there are different groups within Slack, I would imagine. Different uh groups there, it's, within uh, the joined the Okay. I did. You know what? We have a lot of groups on our Slack channel and it would just make me a little crazy. So it's good to know if they saying, hey, we're in this part of the country or we do this kind of work. That would be really helpful. So wonderful. So I, I think we're good in terms of uh, giving people a little bit more time. I just want to thank you, Meg and Ben, for coming on today and talking to us and giving us all of these great resources. I also want to thank everyone who attended today. We appreciate you taking time out of your day. If you like this webinar, please join us for our future webinars and have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, guys.